actually pleased that I'm good to hear from Amy and Joanne about how to manage and lead in these times of crisis. So let me first introduce a little bit about Amy and Joanne. So Amy Kessler graduated from the Lemberg program um, in 1990. After nearly 20 years in debt capital markets on Wall Street, uh, sh she switched over to pensions. Um, and now she helps pension funds around the world manage and transfer risk. Uh, 12 years into that venture, uh, she and her team have written over 160 billion of pension and longevity risk transfer businesses for Prudential Financial. Um, Amy wanted everybody to know that she's a single mom um, uh, with two wonderful young adult children and a brand new puppy um, who may bomb the meeting tonight, I understand, or may not as the case may be. Um, she is also a very valued and trusted member of our Board of Advisors for the Brandeis International Business School. Uh, she was on a call this morning with me and others on the Operations Committee, and I'm really grateful for her advice. Um, Joanne Aaron graduated from the Lemberg Program in 1994, uh, and she went on to over a 20-year career at Citigroup, uh, but she has just celebrated her fifth year anniversary at HSBC this past Monday. Uh, she is almost through week six from working at home and is certainly working how to do that, learning how to do that quickly in a very uncertain time. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to start um, uh, with, uh, with some questions and I will ask them both of Amy and Joanne. Um, so I'm going to start with the fact that the title of tonight's program is Leading and Managing in Times of Crisis. So um, I'd like to ask you, um, you know, is there a difference between leading and managing in a time of crisis? And I think I'm going to actually start off with, I'll start off with Joanne. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Grady. Um, so yeah, I think there de definitely is a difference between leading and managing in times of crisis and in times of calm. Um, I was actually just, as I prepared for this, took a look in the Harvard, one of the Harvard Business Reviews, and they describe ma um, leading as um, referring to an uh, individual's ability to influence, motivate, and enable others to contribute versus management is controlling a group to accomplish a goal. So I think that's certainly true in any time. Um, but leadership is, is more important now than ever because I think our priorities are all being sort of jumbled and re, you know, rethought as we deal with, with this health crisis, but also with this economic crisis. So I think in this time, it's more important than ever to help, help teams and help those around us not um, sort of be stuck in a tunnel vision of just what's going on right now and, and um, very, very focused and almost in a panic, and really helping the teams to see through that and see into um, the future. We will get through this. We don't know when, I don't think anyone knows when or how, but we will, and really helping to drive, drive the new priorities forward is, is more important now than ever. Okay, thank you, Joanne. Um, so Amy, managing versus leading. Yeah, so I look at leading as establishing trust and telling the truth and being tremendously authentic and demonstrating that you care about your people and your customers and all of the stakeholders that your business is meant to serve. And um, I always say, you know, as people ask me what it means to really be a leader, one of the first things I say is in order to be a great leader, you have to love your people. And, and you can always tell, sort of if you, if you flip that around, you can always tell when someone is not in the right leadership position, if it's not about how they care for their people. And this is a time of uncertainty and anxiety and health challenges and worry for our loved ones. Um, this is a time where really showing that caring for your people is fundamental. We have to care for our people first before we can manage this crisis. Thank you. Um, and 
actually quite interesting to sort of move on to that uh, from that uh, today in the New York Times. Another Brandeis alumni, Tom Friedman, had a, a top had a, had an article on this very subject that might be interesting to look up after after this talk. Um, okay, so so it's important to lead. It's important to to, to um, take care of your the people that work for you in your organization and that work with you in your organization. Um, can you? Um, uh, share a story of what it's like to be uh, where you are right now in your organization, um, and maybe some examples of how you're able to, to lead your teams. Uh, Amy, I'll go back to you to start off this. Sure. I, um, I have a couple of very short stories. Um, you know, one is a, a close colleague of mine uh, has had the, the virus, and, um, and his husband has had the virus. And um, he chose to tell me that he had the virus after two and a half weeks of being sick and dialing into calls every day. And, um, and that just sort of really hit home about the, the stresses that people are experiencing um, and the, the challenges that people are feeling and still, you know, perhaps grateful to be able to work and work from home. But, um, but I just wanted to make him chicken soup and tell him he should have not dialed in. Um, another story, you know, just has to do with managing the financial challenges that come at a time like this when the markets are in disarray. Um, we have a very intricate hedging program for some aspects of our business. And for some period of time, it was impossible to effectively execute some of the hedges that were required under our program. And, you know, so you have to make good choices about what do I do in this situation? Um, is there a dynamic hedge I could have? Is there, you know, what can I, what can I, what can I pivot to that isn't my usual thing that will get the job done at a time when risk is attenuated? Um, a third story is about our customers and our call centers. Um, we have millions of retirees who have annuities from Prudential. And then in another uh, related business, we have millions of, of, of people who are saving for their retirement and investing toward their secure retirement. And all of these people are, of course, experiencing tremendous anxiety. And so call volume in our call centers was up 80%. And at the same time, we were experiencing a lack of um, ability. Uh, one, of our, one of our call centers in India, the people couldn't get to work and they didn't have the ability to work remotely. And so um, while we have 80% more call volume, we have one call center at some part in some part of the world go down and we fix that but these are the kinds of things you wake up every day and it could be a people challenge it could be a challenge of understanding the event and its implications it could be a matter of business continuation it could be a matter of market considerations and hedging program it could be a customer concern and then it could be, well, we're here to sell something. Are we going to sell things in 2020? Can we, and this is the way I say it to my team, can we have a 2020? Thank you, Amy. That's, that's very pertinent. I can, I can very much understand that. Joanne, do you want to um, uh, say what, what is going on in your organization? What's it like being there right now and some of the challenges you're facing? Yeah, sure. So it's, it's um, your choice of, of the question is funny. What, what it's like being there right now, because of course there's very few people who are physically there right now. We're all wherever we, we live. Um, but it's, I'm amazed how, how well it's working so far. And I think some of the literature says people get more and more stressed after a few, say four or five weeks, um, you know, which I guess is right around now. So, you know, let's, we'll see what happens. Our human resources certainly sending out an awful lot of communication on that. Um, 
one thing about you know HSBC is obviously we're a, a global company with a huge presence in Hong Kong. So I guess at least personally, I had a I guess head start so to speak because I have my colleagues there who have been. As Bianca said, I've been living through this for about six weeks. They they're on probably week twelve or thirteen. So we kind of had a bit of a playbook to do with that part of the world and how how to deal with um, both on an emotional and also on a very tactical basis. You know, how do we deal like with the call centers? You know, we have, um, as I'm sure all, all companies do or large companies, a business continuity plan. The business continuity plan called for, you know, well, let's have split sites if we need to, if uh, the the Philippines, um, you know, call center isn't working. Well, well, no problem there. We'll switch over to, you know, the one in um, in Warsaw. Obviously, you know, that that plan didn't work because it, it was obviously a, an event that impacted globally. Um, so I I feel like it's been actually quite nimble. People have been um, pretty adjustable to working in lockdown, and also I think just being very tolerant of what. Um, what everybody's capabilities are from home. Um, my my son is 15, so I'd say he's self-sufficient, which doesn't mean he's always making the right choices. But you know, I, I for better or worse, I can't really direct him. But you know, a lot of my the people who work for me have small children, and they just have to really figure out when they can do their work, and maybe they're not going to do as much as normal, and that's going to be just fine. Um, the other thing you know that I'm certainly bearing in mind is is stress takes this type of stress impacts everybody differently and it's a very personal thing because it's a health crisis and you just have to you know acknowledge that and, and be tolerant of people's um their concerns and also like i said their their circumstances um and the other thing i'd say just in terms of, of leadership that i've seen in inside the company and outside and also i'm certainly trying to do is, is communicate as much as possible i was starting at the beginning to have like two times a week, so bi-weekly calls with my team, just check-ins, nothing to do with work, just how is everyone doing? And then I'm, after a few weeks, I thought, okay, maybe we just go to one week. And when I asked them, they're like, no, no, let's, let's continue two weeks. They just, like everybody just really wants to get together and have a chat. Um, can I, I can't, okay. Are you, you finished? Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay, good. So just getting together and having a chat. And then, um, uh, but so it, it's interesting listening to you. You clearly have, both of you have very good relationships with, with the people you work with and um, are able to, I think, probably foster an environment that they're in, in this strange time that, that they, they're grateful for. Um, were you able to prepare for, for the, I'm certainly you didn't prepare for a pandemic, but it, do you think that things that you did earlier before this started um, have has been able to positively influence the way that you have responded to this um, to this unknown event that just occurred? Um, actually, I'll go to Joanne and then I'll go back to Amy. So do you want to yeah. continue? Yeah, sure. Thank you for that question. I, that's a good question. Um, I would say absolutely yes. I mean, you know, if if everything goes according to plan, you shouldn't have to make massive changes when there is a crisis, whatever it is, because you should be operating in a well-organized way that's obviously, that's prepared for things to, to go awry. You know, if you're relying on everything sort of as just in time, which I think a lot of companies are finding that really isn't gonna work, um, probably in many circumstances, but especially now. So, you know, you should have your, your procedures and your policies and so forth that that are, are set to be sustainable regardless. Um, one thing, like I've certainly um, instilled in my global team is our, our team, I guess you'd call it our motto or our mantra, which is to proactively enable risk management. And that can look very different <laughs> in different times. So, you know, what, what we had to proactively managing risk, we had our say 10 goals um, in, in order of priority, you know, in January that I'd set. Those obviously, maybe some of those 10 aren't even on the list, maybe something that wasn't is on, but we're still trying to proactively manage risk. And I think it's really setting people up in my job, but probably in most, to, to be able to, to not just survive, but to thrive in a world of ambiguity, because the world is ambiguous, obviously more now probably more than ever, but 
you know, you, you want to be ready for that because things are not always going to go according to your plan. And you, you want to be, again, set up for that in a business as usual setting so that now, yes, of course, things have changed, but hopefully the team was set up and, and that's the way the world is now much more than it used to be is you have to be agile. I think it's sort of like one of the new, you know, popular words. You have to be agile and nimble, able to, to pivot as another popular word to um, sort of whatever is coming at you. So Amy, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so I think of three things when, when you ask this question. So the, the first one is business continuation planning. The second one is financial risk management. And the third one is management reporting. And I'll say just a teeny bit about each one. Um, if you think back 10 years ago, our business continuation was focused on um, a hot site and a backup site. And those sites were like bunkers and they had generators and they had diesel fuel and, and, and you'd assume that everybody could get to them and, and or essential people could get to them. And um, at the time of Hurricane Sandy, we recognized that actually, you know what, the whole East Coast could go down and then your hot site and your backup site and your, you know, and your, your third backup site, like they could all be down. And it was at that time that we completely changed our business continuation approach to people need to be able to work from anywhere. And that has helped us, but it has also set us up for creating flexible work arrangements and remote work arrangements, and that's been good for talent and good for a lot of other things. So, so that's one area where things we did before allowed us to seamlessly take all of our U.S. businesses, and that's tens of thousands of people, and overnight send everyone to work from home, and it, and it, it worked. And that's a miracle. And I'm going to throw a party for the business continuation and technology teams when it is lawful to do so. Um, the second thing that we did uh, that is just making all the difference in the world right now is our financial risk management, where um, we are just boring and we've been boring and we've been managing, you know, matching our assets and our liabilities and, and hedging things to to very tight tolerances for a very long time. We often lose business because we're very careful, um, but we win plenty, so it's not a problem. But this financial risk management, you realize in a time like this when the markets have completely fallen out of bed, that all of that careful financial risk management and all of that hedging, like this is the moment that that is built for. And thank goodness uh, we, stuck to our discipline in that area. Um, the third thing that we've done is management reporting. And I, I focus on that because what I've done is I've brought together a team of people who represent all of the different major functional areas. We get together literally every single day to talk about what is it that is a crisis today. And we don't all stay on the phone to work through it, but we're able, because we have the right management reporting and we have the right insight and information as to where challenges are arising and the communication is very good, we've been able to have this sort of leadership team that then can very, very quickly pivot and delegate to the, the right folks to get a challenge handled immediately. And, um, and the folks have just totally risen to the occasion to manage things in, you know, no time flat. Um, and that agility that Joanne spoke of has, you know, you have to know what you're trying to manage. And, and that, that's where the reporting and the communication come in. But then you have to, with agility, turn and try to solve it. So that's good. So careful preparation has, has helped and um, um, it, as it should. So um, another thing that's going on right now is, is because all of these changes, people are facing adversity. I mean, they're being furloughed from their jobs. Um, they're having to just do things differently um, and think about their lives even slightly differently. Um, 
have you in the past, um, and I'll start with Amy, have you in the past in your careers had to pivot or, or can you give advice to people perhaps now that are, are making that pivot on how, on how to do this? Yeah, so um, I was a, a principal at Bear Stearns uh, just before the financial crisis and, and in the midst of the financial crisis and like all good captains, I went down with the ship. And um, and I I learned a lot at that moment. Um, the first thing I did was I reminded myself that even though my circumstances had changed, I was still the very same person that had done all the other things that I had previously done in my career. And of course, I would be able to go on and succeed and thrive. Um, even if I had to change careers, which actually I did, I, I went from banking to insurance. Um, but I felt, well, even if I have to change the kind of company I work for, the kind of work I do, I, I, I just said, I'm still the same person. I'll be able to thrive and succeed at that. I will rebuild. And I think that's, uh, that, that attitude, that mantra, like even if you don't, exactly believe it when you first start saying it that mantra is so helpful um it, in the moments where it's feeling very stressful um because it helps to build resilience and the reality is that if i you know we're now 13 years later and there have been many 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 days in fact most of the days in the last 10 years where I would tell you that I feel fortunate that I had to make a change at that time because I have so much more confidence now that I can thrive and succeed in a variety of different situations. I have so much more confidence in my own leadership. I have, I have so much more confidence in my own ability because before that, I thought, well, maybe I've succeeded because I'm at Bear Stearns, or maybe I've succeeded because of the people around me, or maybe I've succeeded because the market was so good. And so sometimes this bumpy road, um, you know, pressure makes diamonds. Thank you. Okay, Joanne? Sure, so I guess I was lucky, if, if you wanna call it that, that I was in city groups, workout group, when the last crisis, has hit. So I was certainly um, guaranteed employment for that time. Um, I had been in project finance before that. So I'd been, you know, structuring and, and selling um, syndicating projects for um, the Americas, mainly US power. Um, and then I'd moved and then I, that was, I loved it. I did that for seven years. Then I'd had my son and I realized, you know, I couldn't really be on a plane to Mexico at a moment's notice and all for a week. So I moved to the workout group in 2005, um, thinking my career was doomed because at that point, that was July 2005, there wasn't one non-performing loan in the entire Citigroup US portfolio. So the workout group was a pretty boring place to be. Um, and then along came, you know, the fall of 2006 when the subprime crisis just started and all of a sudden um, the job got really interesting and, you know, we're obviously in uncharted territory. Um, the banks, including um, especially City, was not capitalized. They weren't capitalized at all like they are for this crisis. Um, so, you know, Citibank got a four, $45 billion bailout from the U.S. government. And I was lucky enough to be then a part of a very small team. I was the risk management um, representative to make sure the government's assets that were ring-fenced were properly protected by anything the bank did. So, I mean, that... That was an extremely challenging and stressful situation. Obviously, it went on for an awfully long time, um, but it certainly is is something you know. I certainly wouldn't have wouldn't be who I who I am today. Wouldn't have learned as much, and not just the content because you can learn content anytime, anywhere. But I think the word I'd say is like the grit, like what Amy described to survive. And you know, I was like, wow, I can survive that. You know, what what worse can happen? And sure, things are different now, and they're they're bad and maybe worse in different ways, but you know, having been through that, I've certainly learned that I can get through it. Yeah, and it, I think it's so important to be focused on the fact that um, we've come through a crisis 
it was a very different crisis, but also a very severe one. Um, and I think having that experience of the roller coaster doesn't only go up, the roller coaster goes up and down. And, um, and, and, and as difficult as these situations are, um, we will get through it. And some of that hope, I think, comes from experience. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So knowing that things will continue, uh, that's, um, and in a good way. So as leaders, um, who do you look to for inspiration and guidance um, and examples of leading during these times or when you need to get through something? Is there, are there particular individuals that you would cite as being very important to you? Um, I'll start with Amy. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's a, a woman named Brene Brown. Millions of people have watched her TED Talk. Um, she is all about sort of um, being vulnerable and authentic and living life in a wholehearted way, which effectively means you give everything you do, everything you've got, basically. Um, uh, and so when I'm sort of struggling to get re-centered, to have the energy to, to try to figure something out, I usually uh, read a Brene Brown book or, or, or usually do it on audio book so that I can sort of hear that wisdom of what it takes to, to just live wholeheartedly, be vulnerable, be authentic, um, tell the truth about the situation we're in, which is a very, very difficult one and has you know, there's no sugarcoating what's going on, but, um, but with, uh, with, you know, a real commitment to authenticity and people and all of our stakeholders, uh, if we keep them at the center of the work that we're doing, we'll do, we will do our best. We will get through it. Okay. Thank you. Joanne? Yeah, so I just want to, Brene Brown, she, she's one of my favorite authors too, and I'd recommend everyone listen to her on Audible because she reads her books and she's just absolutely fantastic and such a, Great. right, such an authentic leader. But um, actually, when I was thinking about this question, you know, I guess you think of people like Abraham Lincoln or Gandhi, but honestly, who I'm finding as um, leaders now during this time is, is quite unexpected. Um, Zoom. So I had never used Zoom before six weeks ago, and I don't think HSBC was quite ready to roll it out, but then they did really quickly <laughs> when we all ended up at home. And I'm finding it so surprising in terms of the leaders that come forth because it, to me, it really gets rid of hierarchy. Like just, you know, everybody's got this little same size postage stamp picture on the screen. It's not like you've got the big boss sitting in the corner the analyst sitting at the, you know, the, the back of the table or even at like the second row, everybody's got the same voice and the same, basically, I feel like it's a real equalizer. So like I mentioned on my team meetings, um, I feel like it's just, it's, people are very open, like they're certainly being more transparent, but the wisdom coming from everyone, I just find really um, inspirational. So I mean, one, one example is I have a one of my team members is, you know, in our in our like service center in Calcutta, and she has become such a part of the team now. She'll join all of our meetings, and just the wisdom coming from her and hearing how things are going from her, for her in India um, is just really inspiring. And then just one other story. So I have I had my global team call this morning with about sixty people, and you know normally it's very you know, okay here's what we're doing with our framework. Um, we did talk about like, here's the economic scenarios, here's, here's what's going on with climate risk, um, you know, very sort of um, specific things that we're working on. But I, I opened up um, by just asking sort of what, you know, what are people doing differently? And again, it's a group of 60 people, you can't really have a chat, but one of my team members who's based in Dubai said, you know, he was so stressed and he, he read a poem that he'd written 
about it was titled lockdown and he just wrote how he was feeling and it just made everyone open up and one person started showing the pictures he was putting together his photo album someone else in mexico city who had said she hasn't cooked in a decade said she's learned to cook so anyway i just i mean i guess not exactly one leader but just very inspirational sort of leadership coming from all over the place thank you it sounds like you manage a very international team. And um, again, it's probably nice because you're probably doing more on Zoom and, and getting everybody together in a way that you, you didn't before. Um, right, exactly. Especially, and that's an interesting point because HSBC is obviously the head office is in London and being in New York or somewhere else, you know, you're, you're kind of normally at a disadvantage because most of the senior leadership is sitting around a conference room in London. Not so anymore. It's everybody's, you know, everyone's got their equal spot at the table. So that's been, if there were a silver lining out of, of this terrible, you know, tragedy, that would probably be one. Yeah. I, go ahead. Amy. I think there's, yeah, I think there's another diversity and inclusion thing that comes out of this, which is, um, I used to mistakenly believe that only some roles could be remote or flexible. And I now firmly believe that every role can be remote and flexible. And, um, and I, what I'm kicking myself because I am a single mother and it took this to prove to me that basically every role can be remote and flexible. And I'm, so I'm learning. Uh, but I think that I, I don't think I'll be the only hiring manager who recognizes going forward that there's a lot of wonderful talent out there that isn't three miles away, that isn't going to come into the office every day, that may have caregiving responsibilities for children or parents that um, who can work from home. And uh, I know I'll be thinking that way in the future as I, uh, as I hire people when this is all over. Good. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask one last question, and then we're going to open it up. But I'd like to end on saying, on asking, um, is there, can, can um, both of you share ways in which your Brandeis experience, and I'm going to put it broadly, either your experience from many years ago while you were there, or your identification with Brandeis values, um, how has this stayed with you your, throughout your career path and perhaps helped you um, today in today's environment? Um, and I'll start with Amy. So I firmly believe that what I learned at Brandeis was that um, the environment changes all the time. And you might have had a perfectly good strategy yesterday, but it could be completely unsuitable for the environment we're in today. And um, I know I learned that at Brandeis. Um, and when you think about how quickly the world changes, and when you think about what's going on now, um, I'm very glad I learned that at Brandeis because I sure need it. Thanks. Joanne? Um, yeah, I would say also, I mean, Brandeis certainly, the Lemberg program in international economics and finance taught me to be sort of nimble. Um, you know, things are ambiguous and I think I, I certainly learned that lesson there. But I also, I learned some of the hard, the core skills like Amy was talking earlier about, um, you know, the, the financial risk management. I mean, these are, it's not all about, well, let's just be agile. You obviously need the core data underlying it. And I will certainly never forget sitting um, in Peter Petrie's statistics class <laughs> and just learning all the nut, you know, sort of the nuts and bolts of, of statistics and accounting and all those things that really you know, that they underpin their good data, and then obviously we can build on that. And that was 26 years ago, but I do remember that. <laughs> so the technical basis for what you do today was exactly. uh, learned at Brandeis. So that's, yeah. that's good. Okay, so thanks um, for, for, for answering these questions. We're gonna now open it up, and I believe people in the audience have questions, and I think Shane Dunn is going to uh, moderate that part. Yes, thank you, Katie, and thank you, Amy and Joanne. I think it's been a really great panel so far. I think our first question is from uh, Tanya Zukin. Uh, Tanya, I'm going to try to unmute you, and if you're able to be on video, great, but um, go ahead if you uh, can hear. Hello, Tanya. Hello, Tanya. Hello, Tanya. Okay. It's 
Tanya, can you hear us? Okay. We'll work on getting Tanya uh, access here. I apologize. Um, all right. Uh, all right, there's one question here I have. Uh, I'm going to read it in the chat. Uh, this is from Rick Cohen. Uh, he says his son will be starting at Brandeis in the fall. One of his roles at MetLife Property and Casualty is that he leads their risk management team. During a team huddle this week, one of his team members asked me what's, what keeps him up at night. He actually responded, I'm having the opposite issue now. I'm so exhausted. I'm falling asleep each night quickly as I am so exhausted. Uh, what is it that's keeping all of you up at night? Um, the fact that people are dying alone. <sighs> I I don't know what to do with that one. Joanne, do you have anything? Or Katie even? Yeah, I mean, well, I certainly echo that, Amy, and lots of other aspects of this terrible health crisis. But um, I can relate to, um, the, is it Rick who asked the question? Um, of being exhausted, I think being on camera like all day because I am on on calls <laughs> and on video all day is exhausting. And I have to tell you, um, I'm sleeping all night, but I'm also pretty tired during the day. And, and I have to admit, I'll, I'll slip off for a nap sometimes, and I don't have a meeting. And then I I end up working till two in the morning, so my schedule is completely messed up too. I think just by the fact that we're not having that, um, you know, we're not we're not having that division between work and socializing and home. Um, I think it's just very hard to keep a, they say you should set a routine. I'm, I must say I haven't been very successful at that. I, I do have a lighter answer, which is my puppy does keep me up. Oh, that's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would maybe take that one too. I, I think I have a busy answer. It's, um, there's so much going on from um, trying to, um, uh, get new students um, coming in, enrolling new students to trying to make sure that our classes are, um, especially our online classes are as good as they possibly can be. Can we bring them up a notch technologically um, to how can we structure our programs next year so that students, maybe they don't wanna graduate in December, but they can graduate in May uh, because the job market really stinks right now. And it's like all of these things are going on and then at 2 a.m. I think, oh my goodness, I didn't get back to that person and I'll wake up and write a note to myself to do that in the morning. And that's, that's what's keeping me up at night right now. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Tanya, we're gonna go to you after this next person, but I think the technical issue, if you can unmute yourself as well, we should fix this, but I wanna, um, so I'll come back to you in a second. The next person who has a question, his name is Jimmy. Jimmy, do you wanna go ahead, please? Yes, thank you, uh, Shane. Thank you for both panelists. Uh, my name is Jimmy. I graduated from uh, Brandeis in 2016 from, uh, you know, I was in the MBA program. And as I said, my question is to both panelists. I believe that they, you know, since they manage risk at both uh, their companies, they, um, they probably have a view on, you know, what's going on in the world. So I would want to know, when did you, uh, you know, at both organizations, when did you, uh, when did this come into view that coronavirus was going to be an amazing risk that you needed to monitor? Is it when, you know, things started escalating in China or were you caught off guard like everybody when, you know, this became a serious problem uh, in the U.S.? Um, so I was communicating with my teams um, in the first half of February, uh, basically so i'm a longevity expert so maybe it's not fair that but but it was very clear to me um that this would would potentially be a significant event and the um the thing that helped me identify it was um uh, i've studied very carefully the h1n flu event in 20 in, in 2014 and 2015 and and the impact of the H1N flu on mortality, um, and especially on mortality in the lowest income decile in the countries where we write risk, uh, because it, it it the H1N flu in in that year 
um, really impacted low income people significantly more, a disproportionate share of deaths were in lower income groups. Um, and so it was fairly early on in February that I started thinking, yeah, I wonder if this will be like the H1N. Um, as it turns out, and I'm gratified to say that the mitigation that everyone is doing by staying home, um, we have the possibility that the coronavirus event may end up being um, similar in magnitude and perhaps even smaller in terms of the mortality that, that occurs than the H1N event. Um, but, but yeah, I was pretty early February thinking, wonder if this will be like that. Jimmy, I do not have nearly as an insightful um, an answer as Amy did. I, I was, um, so I was in London for the last week of February, first week of March with, for work. And when I flew over, whatever that Monday was in the last week of February, um, not, not, nobody was talking about it here other than like it's something happening in China, um, in a province in China. And I was really, it was interesting because when I got to my office in Canary Wharf, there was hand sanitizer everywhere, which I'd never even seen in London before. <laughs> and there was that, you know, it was just everywhere in the office, big signs, wash your hands. And it just seemed like them, that week, London was really much more attuned. Like I said, when I left New York, it was like something that may as well have been on Mars. It certainly felt that way. Um, but then that first week in March, I think that's when like the New York Times came out with an article about how, you know, how to wash your hands and how to stay safe. And then Italy got hit. So certainly from my perspective, it seemed to, to come really quickly and as a surprise. Um, maybe other people in the bank were, were prepared, but certainly, you know, it, it, it was seen um, as pretty much a, a um, geographic issue for, I, I think, for quite some time. And then just the speed with which things shut down was pretty, I, I found it pretty incredible. Like we went from pretty, you know, normal life. I was at a Broadway show to, um, you know, everybody was was told. Then we went to a team A and B at work. So we had, you had like half the team coming in one week and then half another week. And then that was that was over within like four days. So I would say probably St. Patrick's Day was really when things hit. Thank you. I think we have time probably for two questions. We're going to go to Tanya and then I'll take one from the chat. Tanya, it looks like you're ready to go. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Go ahead, Tanya. Oh. Deb, that we are incurring not only here, but around the world. Like, what is going to be the economic fallout and the fallout on our people from these trillions of dollars of debt that's being added to our system? Julian, Amy, right. looks like we, I don't think we got the full question, but do you understand the question? Just to make sure. I think it's a question for Katie. Great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <The economist. laughs> um, uh, um, so what is the economic fallout? I mean, I'm a microeconomist, so I'm going to uh, step back a little bit. I'm not so sure I have any greater insights than people who are working in the markets um, right now. Um, uh, I mean, we are taking on a tremendous amount of debt. Can we ever grow fast enough so that we can get through the debt? Um, I believe there probably will be a period that we grow pretty fast once we get out of this, um, but it's probably gonna hang over our heads for a very long time. Do, do either of you who work in the financial markets have, have any insight on this? Yeah, I mean, if you just pull four, five, six, nine months, of um, of most of our discretionary spending out of the system and think about what that means uh, for negative growth. Um, the challenge becomes there's so much destruction of value in small businesses, in restaurants, in um, you know the 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 businesses that don't make it to the other side, 
there's so much destruction of value there that I I worry I worry about the recovery. So then you turn to the um, the the stimulus packages and the the aid packages that are coming through, and the real question becomes: Show me that those packages help businesses actually exist on the other side, so that um, so that we can have that recovery. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for signs that the stimulus is enough to avoid that massive destruction of value. Um, but clearly, I mean, if you look at credit spreads, the, the, it's very clear that default and downgrade risk is attenuated, that in this crisis, there are some industries, just a few, that are gaining substantially in terms of the importance of their business models in this environment, um, and many other businesses where you, I pray they make it to the other side so that the recovery can be robust and rapid. Thank you. This is going to be the final question. I'm sorry to those we didn't get to. We do have several really good questions um, in the chat. So thanks to folks for chiming in. Uh, we have a question from Lisa Klein in the chat, and I'll just read it. Uh, Lisa is an independent consultant to a bank that is dealing with a similar customer service issue, uh, closing contact centers, and she's finding that they are just jumping from one fire to the next. She's trying to advise them on the value of planning and taking a moment to pause, evaluate, and plan. And she's wondering from the panelists, maybe we start with Amy, have you had any similar situations of leaders wanting to jump to try and solve problems without taking a breath to plan and evaluate? Um. I think taking a breath to plan and evaluate is uh, is is the right advice. So that that would be the good advice. Um, you can't jump from one problem to the next without solving the one you were just on, or at least putting it in safe hands and delegating it to someone who you know will get the football into the end zone. Um, I you know I I think that some of these operational challenges. One of the things that I've felt really grateful for is that we never offshored all of our operations. Um, a lot of companies did that um, in this in this situation. I'm not sure what I would have done. I would tell you that um, with our offshore call centers, we have in fact been able to get people functioning remotely. Um, it's been challenging, but it but it can be done. Uh, but it takes focus, resource, and uh, and significant investment in in order to make sure that things actually continue to work smoothly. Joanne, would you add anything to that on the taking no. the, the breath I'll to plan? I'll try to do it really way. quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like that's I wouldn't call that leadership. I call that management people who are trying to be very tactical. But one thing that that we're doing. Um, and I think, I don't think we're alone, I think many companies are, is coming up with something, we're calling it a clearinghouse, but basically somewhere where we're, where anyone who's doing anything abnormal, and what I mean by that is like outside of policy or outside of procedure, or maybe even something that would be, um, well, probably not outside of regulation without the regulators approving it, but something, maybe it even would be, and then you'd seek their approval, because we're not in normal times, and then we're not just saying, okay, throw caution to the wind, just do whatever you need to, like home, trading from home is a great example, um, because you can't do that, it wouldn't be worth the risk, but we're taking these things to a clearinghouse where people clearly outline the risks, explain them, decide, you know, discuss what they're doing to mitigate it, discuss whatever protocol, like I said, whether it's going to the regulators or some higher governance forum for approval, and then, you know, given that the process has been gone through quickly, documenting it properly and keeping that inventory so that we're not madly rushing through things and saying, yeah, trade from home, we, you know, we're in an emergency and then we don't know what we've done. So we have this list and then when we're back to normal, we can either see, okay, well, now we're back to normal, let's reverse these things or actually, hey, we've actually come up with a more pragmatic way, let's keep it. But I think, you know, that it's really important to balance pragmatism with discipline, especially in a time like this. 
Thank you. Katie, do you have any final words you want to share before we move on? No, I just want to thank both Amy and Joanne for providing some really insightful and, and answers from leaders. And just, just thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you to, J to Joanne, to Amy, to Katie. I think if we were physically in the same room, we probably would applaud uh, and say thank you and then go off to networking. I'm sorry we can't do that tonight, but uh, we are really grateful to all of you for joining this evening. Um, on behalf of Brandeis International Business School, we hope to see you again in a future event. Please keep in touch with the school, uh, brandeis.edu slash global to learn more about what's going on at our school as well as the university. And uh, again, everyone is in our thoughts during this time, regardless of where you are or what you're working on, as well as the health of your family and friends. Uh, I'm gonna end tonight by turning it over to Tally Potter uh, from the Brandeis Women's Network to close things out. Tally, can you join us, please? Absolutely. Trying to join. You're good, Tally, go ahead. Okay, great. Hello. Uh, thank you, Katie, Amy, and Joanne for a timely and insightful conversation. My name is Tally Potter, and I'm co-chair of the Brandeis Women's Network, which co-sponsored tonight's event. I'm also a member of the undergraduate class of 1997. The Women's Network was launched nearly a year ago to bring together Brandeis alumni and friends to share ideas, insights, and experiences through engaging events and programs, and to capitalize on the dynamic community that was created, created while we were on campus. We've held in-person events in New York, we launched a Facebook community, and we've been holding virtual events on Zoom, including various learning sessions, happy hours, book club, wellness events, even cooking classes. So if you're not familiar with our group, uh, look for Brandeis Women on Facebook and join our community. I promise we're fun. Um, some upcoming events include our first book club gathering on April 28th. Uh, we have a session on successful parenting and working parenthood amidst COVID-19 on April 29th. We have a meditation, guided meditation classes beginning May 6th, and even a primer and maximizing LinkedIn um, on May 14th. The full schedule can be found on our Facebook group. Again, thank you, Amy, Joanne, and Katie for leading this very important session. Thank you, Brandeis community, for coming tonight. Please stay safe, healthy, and connected to Brandeis. Thank you, thank you everyone. Stay Have a great healthy. night or, Bye. or day. Bye-bye. Thank you. We'll buy ourselves. I think we're good, right? Back. Oh, okay. Good. Sorry, so I'm trying to exit. Thanks. Thanks to all of you. Yeah, that was that was awesome. Yeah, thank well you, Katie. Katie, that was really good, and Shayna was awesome, and Gina. Um, do you have? I saw all these um, all like all these chats. I guess I can still see. Can we read them? I'd just be interested to right. see what people were saying during the kind of questions and so forth. Um, yeah, actually, uh, we will, we will have that. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, I just don't know how if I if I leave meeting, I don't know if I'll lose all that. I probably will. Yeah. Um, give me one 